There is a little in the world of media that causes fights quicker than comic book casting. People love these characters and in some cases have spent decades becoming familiar with their mannerisms, their quirks, their ideals, and that makes it easy for studios to not get it right when finding an actor who can embody what's on the page. I'm Josh from WhatCulture.com and these are 10 terrible castings that doomed comic book movies. Number 10, Shaquille O'Neal as Steel. Steel. Now this one is at the bottom because Steel has a lot more problems with it besides the casting of its central character. But still, casting Shaquille O'Neal definitely didn't help matters. Now, don't get me wrong, Shaq is an icon, but he definitely was never the best actor in the world. And Steel is one of the biggest examples of his weaknesses as a performer. As a character, John Henry Irons is a brilliant but easygoing scientist who looks up to Superman so much that he eventually crafts his own Iron Man-like suit from scratch to fight crime with. It's cool, but in the hands of Shaq, pretty much all of that charisma and charm that Irons is supposed to embody is lost into the void that is his monotone performance. Even at his prime in the 90s when this came out, Shaq was just a fundamentally bad pick for this character, and hopefully DC learns their lesson on this front whenever they finally get around to giving Steel another shot. Yeah, I know, that's probably a pipe dream, isn't it? Number 9. Sylvester Stallone as Judge Dredd, Judge Dredd. I am the law. With the delivery of these four words, Sylvester Stallone made it clear that this adaptation was definitely going to be more funny bad than genuinely good. Still, Sly Stallone is one of those performers that you just can't bring yourself to ever be mad at, even when he is just the worst possible casting choice for whatever he's in, even Judge Dredd. This flick is one of the great so bad it's good comic book movies, and Stallone's performance lends a lot to that, admittedly. Still, you can see where he and the creative went wrong. There are just some certain aspects to Dredd's character that are non-negotiable, one of which is the fact that he never takes off his helmet, like, never. He is the law incarnate, and as such, he's supposed to be faceless. That's practically the whole point. So, with this in mind, of course the first thing that the movie does is take off Dredd's helmet because, damn it, we have a celebrity in our starring role and we're gonna goddamn use him. Everything about Stallone's performance after this moment has been riffed on to death since the dawn of the internet, so I'm not going to go into it too much here, but just know that it's for good reason. Number 8. Jennifer Garner as Electra, Electra. Electra is one of those characters that is deceptively hard to get right. The best adaptation of her so far has been the one in Netflix's Daredevil, and even that had some really rough spots. But hey, that still puts it way ahead of the Electra movie, which is more akin to one really long rough spot with no hint of smoothness to break it up. Like the previous entries, there are a lot of reasons why this movie sucks, but the casting of Jennifer Garner in the leading role definitely does not help. Now, Ghana is a very talented actress, it's just that her acting style is wrong for this character specifically. At no point do you buy that this is a deadly assassin who could kill more effectively with a paperclip than most men could with a rocket launcher, and that's also due to the fault of the writing I must admit, but the performance similarly fails to back that idea up. Number 7, Miles Teller as Reed Richards, Fantastic Four. Miles Teller's merits as an actor have been the subject of debate for quite some time, and films like Project X and, oh, say Fantastic Four and not what one would call points in his favour. See, playing Reed Richards is a balancing act, one that is very easy to fall off of. On the one hand, you have to capture the hyper-intelligent genius who unintentionally alienates those around him due to him thinking about a thousand times faster than everyone else, but you also have to capture the boundless charisma of a man who was able to convince three of his friends to help him hijack a rocket to space to study cosmic rays. You can't do that if you're boring, trust me. Me, I have tried and Ewan keeps saying no. Similarly, a bit like me, Miles Teller captures precisely neither of these sides of the character, instead coming off as an awkward dweeb who feels like he just read his lines that morning with zero rehearsal and zero care. We're about to get another live action version of Reed Richards and honestly I don't think anyone could play it more flatly and more boringly than Teller does in this movie. The bottom line is, when you make the mid-2000s Fantastic Four movies look like masterpieces by comparison, then that's when you need to take a step back and reevaluate what you've tried to do. Number 6. 
Topher Grace as Eddie Brock, Spider-Man 3. It makes sense that a villain that Sam Raimi was practically held at gunpoint to include wouldn't be the best in terms of depiction, but it is still easy to forget just how bad Topher Grace was for all this role specifically. The director's angle of Venom being a guy down bad doc, given a lot of power instead of a macho iron pumping loser like he was in the comics, is a perfectly sound idea on paper. But Topher Grace just doesn't go hard enough with this concept. Mostly because, well, he He's mid 2000s Topher Grace, and he's far too handsome to come off as the truly pathetic weirdo that Sam Raimi had in mind. On top of that, this film is more interested in the conflict with far more interesting villains like Sandman and the New Goblin than with Eddie Brock, so him becoming Venom doesn't feel nearly as earned in the context of this movie. This, of course, severely weakens the climax considering that Venom becomes the central antagonist by this point in the film, and when the climax is weak, the rest of the film is weakened along with it. Number 5. Dan Dehan as Valerian. Valerian and the City of a Thousand Planets. Valerian was too influential a comic not to be adapted into a Hollywood movie at some point in time. And fortunately for us, it did come out at a time when visual technology could accurately portray the insane world of the source material. Shame, then, that such care did not go into the portrayal of Valerian himself. The minute Dan Dehan was cast as the eponymous lead, it was clear that this movie was destined for obscurity. Again, Dehan is a very talented performer, but he does does excel in playing guys who are almost exclusively the most punchable douchebags in any given room. Which admittedly is fine when he's playing punchable douchebags like Harry Osborn in The Amazing Spider-Man 2, but it presents a problem when playing this character, who is meant to be a swashbuckling hero in the vein of Han Solo. There's just this cavernous disconnect between what he's reading from the script and how he's acting in every scene. It leads to this kind of weird, honestly funny scenario when you want to slug this dude despite the fact that he's technically given you no reason or want to even do so. Number 4. Ben Affleck as Daredevil, Daredevil. Another casting choice that lives in infamy to this day, even those like me who like Ben Affleck as an actor seem to agree that this was just a flat out bad pick for the guy. And I know I have to keep saying this, but Ben Affleck can be very, very good. However, the character of Matt Murdock is just about as far outside of his wheelhouse as it gets, especially for the time. It also didn't help that director Mark Johnson isn't the best director when it comes to actors, so everything Affleck says as Daredevil just kind of falls flat. And for a film this stylized, the last thing you want to be as a performer is flat. Sadly, there's barely feeling behind anything Affleck says in any scene he's in, and for a character as a emotionally as intense as Matt Murdock, that's a big problem. This was clearly a casting decision based on star power more than anything else at the time, as Ben Affleck was one of the most famous stars in the world back then. And in that respect, it is easily one of the most egregious cases of that casting mindset backfiring on the filmmakers themselves. But hey, at least he would get his comic book redemption playing Batman, so swings and roundabouts and all that. Number 3. Chris O'Donnell as Robin, Batman Forever The rest of these entries are mostly about the actor's performance, just being flat out wrong for the character, and sometimes that's combined with the writing or directing not being up to snuff as well. But with Chris O'Donnell as Robin in the final two original Batman movies, there's really just one reason why this casting choice doomed these two flicks. He was just too old for this character. Of course, there's nothing wrong with having an older Robin, but when you look at the script for these movies, especially Forever, it's plain to see that this was just meant for a much younger actor than Chris O'Donnell, who was well into his 20s at the time. The way Robin behaves in this movie would be fine if it were a team teenagers say, but with O'Donnell you have to wonder why this grown ass man needs to be adopted by the Wayne family after losing his parents. Since the movie is so bad at hiding the fact that this supposedly teenage Dick Grayson is clearly old enough to drink, it just makes his moodiness and rebellious attitude come off as a little bit whiny more than anything else. Number 2. Andrew Garfield as Peter Parker, The Amazing Spider-Man God, I'm gonna have to do a major disclaimer for this one, aren't I? Okay, I love Andrew Garfield. The dude is a great actor and he brings it all to these films in particular, and even has some damn emotional scenes along the way. With the right direction, he could have been a solid Peter Parker, but sadly, he was in a movie which didn't seem to get that Spider-Man is cool because Peter Parker is not cool. Garfield sadly played him as being basically the same person regardless of whether or not he's wearing the mask. And simply put, he's just a little bit too cool for this role. Tobey Maguire and Tom Holland work because you can clearly tell a difference between the Peter Parker and Spider-Man identities. Garfield's cool and confidence absolutely works when he's in the costume, but because that carries over to him in just regular life, it doesn't quite work. 
Combine that with the general terribleness of his two Spider-Man movies, and you get nothing short of a waste of a talented actor. Number 1. Jesse Eisenberg as Lex Luthor, Batman v Superman, Dawn of Justice. You can't really get any worse of a casting choice than an actor who was convinced that he was auditioning for someone completely different than who he actually ended up playing. Case in point, Jesse Eisenberg as the Riddler, I, I mean Lex Luthor. Yeah, if you couldn't tell by my definitely accidental slip up there, one of the most memorable behind the scenes blunders of the Snyderverse was the news that the reason Jesse Eisenberg's Lex Luthor was so off brand from the original character was because Jesse was convinced until he was outright told otherwise that he was playing the Riddler. And ironically, Eisenberg would have absolutely hit as the Riddler, whereas he just feels plain wrong as Lex. There are very few things from the comics that you absolutely have to get right for a good adaptation of this character. But one of those things is that he is 100% convinced that he is top dog in the room at all times. And Jesse Eisenberg's manic energy instead gives off a pervasive sense of insecurity. Which, in fairness, could have been a fascinating interpretation of Luther if the film at all decided to explore it, but they didn't, so instead we just get one of the worst casting choices in comic book movie history. So that's our list, I want to know what you guys think down in the comments below, what do you think of these comic book castings, and are there any other ones I've missed off here? While you're down there, can you give us a like, share, subscribe, and head over to whatculture.com for more lists and news like this every single day. Even if you don't, I've been Josh, thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you soon.